world players all vying for control of the Arctic. At stake, billions in resources and strategic holdings for us and our foes. In this special report, we look at the latest geopolitical flashpoint to arrive on the world stage, why control of the Arctic is so contested, and what it means for Americans if we fail. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. World powers all lying the world's northern pole, and it's not just because of the polar bears. Yeah, it's become, I think, one of the hottest zones of competition there is. With warming waters, the region presents boundless possibilities, but also newfound threats. New polar sea routes are opening up that will allow Russia and China to exploit Russian hydrocarbon uh, reserves that have not yet been tapped, but uh, they are so large and the economics of uh, uh, maritime uh, transport are such that it's become very attractive. That's Rick Fisher, senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. He notes that nations are taking steps to tap into those new resources. Uh, Russia already has a large icebreaker fleet and uh, China is also getting into the business of building nuclear-powered icebreakers. So both want to make a lot of money as well as benefit from uh, the much closer and easily, more easily accessible uh, oil and gas reserves of, of, of Russia. As for these strategic states, Bruce Jones, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and author of To Rule the Waves, How Control of the World's Oceans Shapes the Fate of the Superpowers, points out. This is where Russia now has the largest concentration of its naval power. Uh, the United States has begun to return nuclear submarines to the Arctic for the first time since the end of the Cold War. Uh, China is deploying repeated scientific missions, which are, you know, frequently dual use. Um, and so this is really becoming a zone of uh, tense uh, military buildup. Now, as for why the Chinese regime would be keen about the Arctic? For China, the Arctic offers uh, a strategic and, and tactical opportunity were it to conduct uh, patrols of its nuclear missile submarines in the Arctic. Uh, it would complicate uh, tremendously the American effort to defend against those submarines, and it could also uh, build submarines with shorter range missiles. Fisher adds that those threats are particularly concerning to America. There would be a shorter route over the North Pole to attack targets in the continental United States. And if the Chinese regime could get that strategic stronghold, what does that mean in case of an attack on the U.S.? It would be advantageous to China uh, in, in terms of surveillance, being able to monitor uh, the atmosphere and uh, the exo-atmosphere uh, over the Arctic because that would be a major route for its intercontinental ballistic missiles were there to be a nuclear war. Uh, it's not clear that Russia has much of an interest in allowing China to set up military bases, but uh, it is very likely that Russia will tolerate an increased Chinese military presence as long as it's directed against the United States. On that last part, what about Russia's interests in the region? If you're Russia and you want to put a nuclear submarine off the coast of the United States, it comes down through uh, the Arctic waters, through the what's called the Giuk Pass, which is the Greenland, Iceland, UK Pass. It's a channel of water that separates those those countries. Uh, so for, for Russia, it's a very important route to the North Atlantic and to threaten the United States. And given both those powers have a similar goal, they are teaming up and setting aside their differences. They'll come back to competing with each other later. But for now, they have this much bigger fish to fry, which is to try to weaken the West and to weaken the United States. Looking at history, Fisher says we can see just how close that affront could get to the U.S. Uh, defending those submarines was a key mission for the Soviet Navy during the Cold War and remains a very important mission for the Russian Navy. Uh, it is likely that uh, China 
could contribute to the defense of those submarines by helping to tie down american naval forces based ah in alaska or on the american west coast or if you will even hawaii jones notes this is all part of a wider concern defending against the combination of naval and long-range strike power that both china and russia have in substantial measure. Um, the Russian capabilities are so far slightly more sophisticated than the Chinese, uh, but the Chinese are more numerous and rapidly catching up and in some places surpassing Russian technology. Um, so these are going to be issues of ballistic missile defense. They're going to be issues of submarine tracking. They're going to be issues of naval warfare. Um, those are the major areas where we're going to have to be worried about Russian and Chinese capabilities. The U.S. does seem to be noticing what's at stake. The State Department recently announced plans to establish an ambassador at large for the Arctic. Jones calls it a step in the right direction. A state appointing an ambassador is a signal of interest. There's also increasing interest in uh, Northern Command and in the U.S. Department of Defense more generally about the capabilities that are available in the Arctic and what needs to be there in the Arctic. Um, so we'll, I, I think we will see tensions continuing to rise uh, between the United States, uh, its allies on the one hand, and, and Russia and China on the other. Fisher adds next would be... Organization of a coalition of democracies uh, concerned about the Arctic is uh, a, a laudable uh, step. Uh, it, it, it is uh, akin to what the United States started doing under the Trump administration trying to organize a coalition of democracies to promote positive and peaceful behavior uh, on the moon. But he says what the U.S. really needs is to boost defense in a more concrete way. There is a clear requirement for a much larger Navy overall, but especially for the resumption of construction of icebreakers. Uh, the United States now has two icebreakers. One of them is 40 years old. Uh, uh, the Coast Guard definitely wants two new icebreakers, uh, but the United States will likely need several more. And uh, these icebreakers need to be configured so that they can be rapidly armed to defend themselves or to military assets of Russia and China. Jones notes some are pushing for change in that direction. Chief of Naval Operations recently issued a, a, a planning report calling for a 600 fleet Navy that's divided between a manned fleet and an unmanned fleet. Uh, that's probably the right architecture, um, but we have not seen kind of seriousness of purpose in Congress to authorize the funding necessary for that. We haven't seen Congress or the DOD being willing to recognize that that requires moving some money out of some of the other services. And now another risk is the threat of nuclear war. Jones says that threat takes the form of submarines, miles beneath the surface of the ocean. And they are once again uh, circling one another and sort of circling the continents when uh, keeping a careful watching eye on developments. They play important intelligence roles, but they are also, of course, uh, an important part of, uh, in, in the United States at least, and, and Russia still to a large degree. Uh, the nuclear triad, um, China is rapidly developing its nuclear capability and its submarine capability. He adds that for now, the threat is not yet upon us. Those are not yet centrally emerged. That's not yet a central part of China's strategic threat, but it will be very soon. So I think we're, we're rapidly sailing back to a place where uh, nuclear launched, uh, submarine launched nuclear missiles are a central part of war planning and of deterrence. But until that threat presents itself, there's another clear interest these powers are battling over the Arctic for commercial purposes. Now, if you think about it from a trade perspective, the difference, the distance between Shanghai and New York, if you can sail the Arctic route, is about half the distance if you have to go through the Suez Canal, across the Mediterranean, and then across the, the Atlantic Ocean. So it has the potential to dramatically uh, cut trade times um, with dramatic uh, savings. It was similar in, in nature to what the Suez Canal did to trade between Asia and Europe when it was first uh, established. So it has the potential to be a major uh, change in global commercial routes. As for just how much is at stake, billions. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here. After being demonetized for more than a year, 
Here's what to look out for in our second half. We continue our coverage of the Arctic. In part two, experts note how on top of strategic stakes, there's also billions worth in resources, the ways the Arctic could change commercial benefits, and more. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Apoc TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore Shenyuncreations.com.